Thanks so much, Don, and thank you, everybody, so far. Uh, I know, uh, to me, personally, this has all been very moving, and I think from what I'm hearing from text that I'm getting, that people are definitely being affected by the things that the panelists have been saying. I mean, in, in an ideal world, this is where we would stop and take 15 minutes for silent meditation, but Kyle and Ethan would not want me to do that right now, but we, we may do a little bit of that during the lunchtime period if you wanna hang around. So this really brings us to one of the last questions that uh, Dawn was posing to the last panel, particularly to Lindsay. Secondary trauma is a thing. We are documenting it and those of us who are lawyers and those of us who are married to lawyers, those of us who've been on juries, you know, we know the trauma is a thing. And we know from our clients who've been traumatized that they're re-traumatized and we need to learn about that. The next panel really gets into the question of, okay, what do we do about it? And we're gonna hear from, uh, let me call up uh, Mark Godsey and Donna Mayerson, uh, Dr. Mayerson, if you guys would appear. Uh, so we're going to hear from these guys who run the uh, run, or work with or run the Ohio Innocence Project, and and then we're going to hear from uh, somebody with the Department of Justice, and then we're going to hear from uh, a psychologist who has all of the answers, no pressure, Kate. But um, let me let me first uh, call on Mark and Donna. So Mark, uh, he's got quite a broad um, background. Right right now, he's the director of the Ohio Innocence Project. In his past, he was a, a prosecutor. Uh, he's appeared on all of the national shows that there are from looking at his list here, including Larry King Live, uh, Dateline, NBC, it goes on. He's been written about in all of the major publications. He's written a book in 2017 called Blind Injustice. A former prosecutor exposes the psychology and politics of wrongful convictions, politics. That's what innocence work is kind of all about, right, Mark? And the law is one thing, but they are all political resolutions. So Mark has, his, his group has exonerated quite a number of people or freed a number of people. They've made a lot of reforms in Ohio and they've been very fortunate as I found out to have Dr. Donna Mayerson come along to, uh, to work with their project. Uh, Donna has a, a PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Utah, and a master's degree in special education from University of Cincinnati. Uh, she worked as director of practice for the VIA Institute, focusing on the science of character and promoting human flourishing. But for our purposes, what we want to hear her talk about with Mark is, you know, what has she done in the Innocence Project of Ohio? Um, when I've started talking about this with other innocence groups, I'm almost coming to the conclusion that innocence work is in many ways harder than, than capital defense, which is very hard. Um, but Mark, let, let, me, let me turn it over to you guys and, and let, let's hear your story and, and what you guys are doing. This is, a, this, is, this is great because it's in one project, what can be done? So tell us why Mark and then tell us how you're doing it. So you need to turn your microphone on, I think, Mark. I'm not sure. Uh, Donna, can you test yours and let's see if it's working? Can you hear me? <clears throat> here, Donna. Um, yeah. Mark, having a little trouble hearing you, but yeah, well, while we're reading Mark's lips, Donna, why don't you start out and, and then we'll then we'll go back over to Mark. Okay, um, so I'm very happy to be here today. Um, Mark has a compelling story to say, uh, to explain sort of how I got involved in this, um, <clears throat> which he'll tell you uh, hopefully in a few minutes. Um, just to say that I'm a practitioner um, and I met with Mark um, several years ago and he told me in a very impassioned way about the impact this work has had on the attorneys and the fellows in the Innocence Project in Ohio. Um, 
I just start off by saying I, I'm not, um, I wasn't about proving or disproving whether secondary trauma or PTSD exists for attorneys. Um, more about understanding what the situation is with the attorneys and the staff in the Innocence Project in Ohio specifically. And so I set about to really discover um, what all the sources of stress and trauma were of in the Innocence uh, Attorneys and, um, and the staff here in Ohio. So I really was looking sort of at sources of trauma um, to understand sort of from the inside out what those were, what the stressors were that they were experiencing. Um, I was interested in looking at um, the processes and outcomes of cases and what the requirements of that were and sort of hearing about the never ending um, onslaught of cases and them never really resolving or, or resolving in different ways. Um, looking at the infrastructure of the project, what sort of supports were in place, what the office dynamics were, um, how much people shared information and supported each other, and also interested in um, what sorts of things were already in place, like were there uh, opportunities for vacations or breaks, um, were they um, having sessions around stress and, um, you know, just what had been done generally. Um, so the way I did that was I interviewed everybody that I possibly could interview. Donna, let me ask, I don't mean to interrupt. Let me, can you describe, and I think Mark would have done this and hopefully he'll be back in a second, describe the physical um, offices there and, and describe who these fellows are, how long they work, because I think that probably plays into a lot of what's going on with your, with your group. Um, so Mark could probably do you a hear better me now? job. Oh, good, Mark, good. Okay. Yes. I, I was scrambling around with tech people trying to fix this, so I didn't get to hear what you said. Did it's you want hard. me to start or do you want me to wait till after it's, you? It sort of made sense for me to go first. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Donna was just talking about some and I, in one of the things I was asking her, and I know you'll touch on is describing physically your offices, you know, the big area and who the fellows are. And then yeah, probably some of what Donna was saying would make more sense. Glad you're glad you're back. Yeah. So sorry about that, everyone. Um, I'm the director of the Ohio Innocence Project, and I've been doing this work since 2001. And what we're doing is um, identifying people in prison who are wrongfully convicted and innocent and then litigating to try to get them out. And, um, you know, being in prison or the criminal justice system in general is traumatic, but for somebody to be wrongfully convicted, just picked out of the blue and sent to prison they didn't do is a particular kind of trauma and pain. And as I got more and more immersed in this work, um, I started at some level realizing I was suffering from secondary trauma. I don't think I could fully articulate it, but I started having anger and sort of depression and anxiety. And by the time we got to about 2013, 2013 is really, really surfaced, where a client whose case I had worked on for a decade and I'd come to, to love him and his family, um, I freed him from prison. And then the prosecutors were trying to retry him. And I was so involved in the case and he trusted me and, and not really anyone else that I was actually going to do the trial, the jury trial. Um, and I have a background as a prosecutor. I have court experience, so I could do it. Um, and so in the spring of 2013, I was actually getting ready for a jury trial right as soon as my classes ended. Um, and I was every week filing motions. And one of the things that I was doing was trying to stop the retrial, saying it's unconstitutional for them to retry them. Um, and finally, I was successful in that about two weeks before the trial was supposed to start. And at that point, it came to a head where I was just so frustrated. And the way I sort of describe it to people is you can imagine somebody who's a doctor in like a Ronald McDonald house or deals with children who have cancer and their patients are dying and the sort of trauma that that would involve. And I sort of relate innocence work to that, except there's an extra layer. When you're a doctor dealing with children with cancer, everyone's trying to save the children and everyone's on the same side. In our work though, we have these people who have been, had the greatest injustices against them. And we had prosecutors who are putting up procedural bars and arguing dishonest things in court and trying to stop it. So it's like, it's like you're a doctor trying to save children, but other people are coming in and trying to steal the medicine. And so you're, you're seeing this intense trauma from your clients, but you're also seeing, in my opinion, sort of the worst of humanity 
and these people that are just operating in their bureaucratic roles and not caring about actual justice. And so by the time I got to 2013 and that happened and I narrowly avoided a retrial, I was just sort of a mess. And I, I said, you know, I've got to step back from these cases. And fortunately by that time I had a large staff and so um, other people could take the cases and I sort of decided I'm gonna write a book and I'm gonna do fundraising and I'm gonna do more high level stuff rather than down in the trenches because I just can't deal with it anymore. And through this time period, 2014, 2015, 2016, um, when I would start talking about this, uh, the, 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 the emotions were so close and, and, and the, the, the scars were so raw that I would start crying. Um, it was hard to even talk about some of these cases. And so Donna, I had known her previously because her family foundation was a donor. And I met her in a, in a restaurant simply to go over sort of their annual re-up of their gift. And she asked me sort of in general, just how are things going with the cases? And I started talking about a case and I broke down crying. So it's like embarrassing. I'm sitting here with a donor and I can't even hold myself together. That's what a mess I was by this point in time. And she starts asking me questions about it. And she's a psychologist with a background in this work. And so almost by pure luck, we developed this relationship. And I'm so fortunate to have Donna because she started counseling me and has been doing so for the past several years. And that has expanded into counseling my entire staff, both in group meetings and individually. Then it's gone on to the student fellows because we were realizing, you know, we'd lose these cases. These, these students had worked on this case their entire year. They were in the project and they would be devastated. They would be shocked at the injustice of the system. And then we'd find out they were carrying this with them two or three years later, working for big firms. And they're still sort of messed up over this experience. And then, it, then she started working with our exoneree. So it's almost like we have an in-house psychologist that's been absolutely incredible. And I'll let you tell it from her perspective, but I mean, she has dramatically helped me to the point where I'm able to handle it much better. I'm actually doing cases again and was able to sort of get me out of that, that um, haze. And I could focus on different things it was doing to me and work on fixing myself. So for example, one of the things was I just didn't, I just didn't care. I didn't have any self-care. Um, and I gained like 60 pounds during that period. I've lost half of that. And I'm on, on my way to losing the rest because of helping her get centered on how I need to take care of myself, which I wasn't doing because of this trauma. Um, and the meditation and other things have, have honestly helped to the point where I'm sort of back in the trenches again, and I'm able to handle it in a better perspective. I was told to go for six minutes and it's been five and I took up some of your time with the technical problem. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Donna to tell her end of the story. Thanks, Mark. Um, <clears throat> you can see how compelling his story is and why it was so per persuasive in terms of um, responding to it, being responsive to it. Um, I think I was starting to say before Mark mm -hmm. got on that my fatal flaw was um, interviewing everybody because everybody I interviewed had a an angle on how they were affected. And so I think it's just a, a professional, uh, I guess, flaw that everybody, I started caring about everybody. And so I started really understanding where the sources of trauma were and how people were impacted and um, really getting pretty clear sense of what was happening in terms of the structure of the office and the, the way that cases were being played out and what kinds of things um, were really impacting people in the most significant ways. Um, and they were all the things that have been mentioned prior to this, you know, in, in the other uh, presentations. They, and similar to the work uh, with asylum attorneys, you know, it was case material that was really hard it was visits to prison, it was losing cases and um, filing and filing and filing again. It was the systemic dysfunction of the system. Um, all of those things had an impact on everyone. Um, and the work itself is endless. Um, one case doesn't seem to end. It bleeds into another case, into another case. And for all people who have parts to play in it, um, it has different demands and different stressors. Um, the, the additional things I think that were, were true, that are true for innocence work in particular, is that cases go on for years and years and years, um, that there are people that are in prison that you have ongoing relationships with, and 
you know, I think attorneys end up being very um, personally invested in those individuals, family members, they have relationship with family members that span many, many years. They also care about these law students who begin their uh, second year of law school the summer before that um, in these fellowships and they last through the year and like Mark said, you know, they they have experienced a lot of the trauma and they're very invested. They're very young and eager to do everything. And so they overwork and they are very um, idealistic sometimes when they start. And so I just became aware of all these things. And then with the exonerees themselves and the people that were released, another burden that I think that many attorneys carry is they work so hard, they become so personally invested in these people's lives that when they get out, um, they're very vested in how they're doing and just carrying the weight of the material goods and needs that they have, basic needs that are not being met by other organizations and systems in place for others released from prison. And so all of this is just a way of saying um, it's, it's a bigger thing than um, one aspect alone, it's all of those things. And so I had to sort of sort through like what's the best way to approach all of this. And um, so I'm just gonna tell you some interventions that um, I've been implementing um, and how it's grown over time. So I started off with the attorneys and staff with um, group psychoeducational um, programming. And just to normalize, to, to help educate on what PTSD is and what secondary trauma is and how it looks and feels because awareness of those um, things that happen, those stressors and the way they impact your life, you become sort of numb to them. You don't realize that you're experiencing them, that you're jaded, that you're, you know, you just, it, we go through life often without really recognizing and noticing how it's impacting us. And so awareness is a huge piece that um, a group format was really good for. But just to say that also everybody has life and their own personalities and their own family dynamics. And so a lot of this work is individualized. So at the same time that I was doing group psychoeducational presentations and bringing in some people also who were doing some stuff on mindfulness and things like that, um, I was also meeting with the attorneys and staff individually to help them sort of assess stress and trauma and to work on individual strategies around that. And uh, another piece of this in terms of behavior change is that, you know, once you're in the habit of living your life and working in a particular way, you have these habits of dealing with stress and trauma. Um, those are really in, ingrained in you and ingrained in all of us. And they're really hard to break. So awareness is one piece of it and changing that is a second piece. But the third piece I think that is really significant is maintaining the changes because we all sort of regress back into uh, the ways that we have functioned forever. So having ongoing contact and you know conversations with these individuals has been really important for maintaining behavior change. And I'll say that especially, especially during the pandemic, it's been essential because the pandemic has flipped everybody, everybody, the work on its head and all of the players on, on you know, they've, it just flipped it upside down. And then just to say um, the piece about the fellows, I'll say quickly, because I know we're, we're over time, is that, um, and many people have talked about law school and preparing young people or people who are in law school for what to expect. I think it's like imperative that it happens. Um, and it happened in a time when people are sort of formulating what their life will be as attorneys and making choices about what kind of law. Um, so I've done some work with the fellows in terms of preparing for the experience and setting expectations, talking about self-care and what the demands are of this work and why it's so critical. Um, I had some videotapes from the attorneys um, and also from the exonerees speaking about the stresses and strains and from the exonerees vantage point, um, how they see this, the stress playing out on attorneys. 
that's been pretty impactful. And then I follow them to the end of the year to talk about how they take this forward. So, and I think that's really critical work. And then the, the last piece of it is the work with the, with the exonerates themselves, because you're, everybody's in this work because they care about the individuals that they're representing. And truthfully, when they get out of prison, that's a huge monumental thing, but it's not nearly what they need in terms of emotional supports and psychological well-being. I mean, there are people who have been very, very abused and broken by the system, and they come out with unbelievable needs. And so this is relative to your stress or as attorneys that having somebody who's helping them with post-release adjustment and with PTSD and, um, and the trauma that they experience and the relationship trauma of, of getting out and trying to reconnect with family members is, is unbearable for um, the attorneys to carry going forward. So I've been meeting with them and doing um, programmatic stuff with them and have just really leaned into supporting them in the best, best ways I can. And that's it in a nutshell. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's bigger than that, but that's what I got for you. Donna and Mark, thank you so much. Uh, we, you know, I know we have at least one exoneree watching uh, Ricky Kidd who got out a year and a half or so ago. If any other exonerees are out there watching, please let us know through the Q&A so we can recognize you. It's, uh, you know, it, it took a while to get people out. There's been over 2,600 exonerations to date and other people have also been freed. But what these people go through is just unimaginable. And I think the lawyers and the social workers and the investigators who work with exonerees can't not be affected. I, I know what it's done to me. And it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult because we want things to go smoothly. But after you've been incarcerated, uh, it's, it's really hard. We had a great question. And, uh, and this brings me to our next speaker, Cheryl Nickham. Uh, Cheryl, if you can turn on your camera and everything. The, the question we got was a, a great one. It says, will you be addressing or acknowledging or including a reference to prosecutors in the secondary trauma they experience? I, I keep hearing capital defender innocence cases, but no one seems to be saying anything about those prosecutors who are meeting these family, these victims and their families. We are all having experiences. Well, that's, you know, that's exactly right. Um, and we, we have reached out and we have somebody here right now uh, to speak about the prosecutor offices. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Cheryl, I'm pronouncing your name right, Nickham. Nickham, uh-huh, that's correct. Okay, okay. Uh, Cheryl is a clinical social worker with the Department of Justice uh, Executive Office for US Attorneys. She's now um, serves as a clinical director for the Project Safe Welfare Wellness Programs. Um, she has a specific job now where she works with um, prosecutors who work with the sex cases and human trafficking, you know, the almost the worst imaginable. So in some ways, Cheryl's on the um, flip side of what Andre was doing. And so the question is, what about prosecutors? And, you know, I just have to say, we, I, it, they don't like to talk about this sort of thing, maybe privately. So <laughs> You know, I know we have, it sounds like maybe a prosecutor on here, which is wonderful, but you know, these things are probably gonna be best dealt with prosecutors talking to prosecutors, maybe judges talking to judges. I mean, each, each area needs their own thing, but um, Cheryl, I'm gonna turn it over to you. If you could tell us about some of the work that you've been doing to sort of normalize awareness in this area. Terrific, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate everything that I've been hearing. I've been sitting here thinking, I'm nodding my head an awful lot because so much of this resonates with, with the experiences that we've had. So I'm gonna be echoing some of the uh, information that you've heard earlier this morning. And I, I wanna start with a quote that I like to use from Dr. Rachel Remen. And what she says is, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to walk through water without getting wet. And so I see our job as helping people to walk through that water and not and to avoid drowning, quite frankly. 
Um, so my work with the Department of Justice Executive Office for United States Attorneys, so we work with um, the prosecution and the prosecution team from, from A to Z. And what I noticed when I came to the department from my um, previous experience working with the Army was that there was some things going on that seemed obvious as a clinician that we needed to be helping folks with, but there wasn't anything in place. And some of that was a result of the, the culture, the stigma, a lot of different um, it, it reason, obstacles to them getting some, some help or some prevention tools uh, dealing with this sort of thing. So what we did, first of all, is, of course, we know, and I, again, working with the Employee Assistance Program was lucky enough to have some buy-in from our front office where they allowed us to contract with the local university. And we did some of the research and we got some of the same findings that you have reported earlier today that yes, people are being impacted. We're losing people. They're moving on to other areas or other career fields. And our goal really should be um, helping our folks stay in the job and stay healthy in the job as well as their family and friends. Um, so from there, we, will, we were able to kind of pre provide a business case analysis as to why we needed to implement a program to address these issues. What we did then is we looked at what were three kind of main areas where we needed to provide our focus. Um, and that was with the organization, the organizational issues, the culture, the, the kind of the team, the prosecution team, and then the individuals themselves. Um, so within that, we broke our program into the wellness component, and then from there, I was able to spin off and develop a peer support team, which is that piece that you mentioned, um, Mark, with the prosecutors talking to prosecutors. And ironically enough, uh, we, we did a video with that uh, program that introduced the team, introduced the concept of secondary trauma. It's only about 10 minutes, but it's very engaging kind of Q&I with some of the prosecutors and support staff. Um, and we, we named that Allies in the Trenches, and that's been very, very well received. So it was funny when you said being in the trenches, I'm like, yes, absolutely, that's what it is. So basically what our goals were was were to increase the awareness and normalize the, the re, that there were going to be reactions to this kind of work and decrease the stigma of getting help. We wanted to integrate our services into this is this is the culture, this is just kind of how we roll, this is part of what we do. Much as you might speak with a new attorney about this is how you process a case, or these are the you know policies and procedures or what have you in the office, this is also part of what we do. This is just how it happens. Here's an EAP person, let them talk to you a little bit about secondary trauma because it's going to happen. It's a matter of to what extent how far you can get in front of it, and at what point in your career it's going to, it's going to happen. And we obviously have had some very lengthy conversations with folks about what uh, the SF-86, which is the background clearance. I am happy to say there's been several revisions with that document. The challenge I have with the revisions is the more that they try to destigmatize the question, the longer it gets. And so it seems actually um, less, less friendly in terms of the response. But in actuality, we have not had um, many folks that have had to answer in the affirmative unless they've gone outside and gotten some real significant care for other issues, addiction or what have you. And I can honestly say there's there's been no one who has been uh, in any loss of their job because of the, as a result of seeking mental health care and in a, in a um, offhand sort of way, what I tend to say sometimes when we have those conversations about how is this going to impact me, the effect of the work if you don't get help is going to have a, a, a more severe detrimental effect on your career and on your, per, on your person, your um, relationships as well than getting help is going to have. So let's do a cost benefit analysis on that. Um, so dealing with that um, from the organizational standpoint, we did a lot of training first for the front office so they could kind of then lead and bring the, bring the message down that people, though they're our most important asset, we need to take care of them. We need to be aware of the impact. We need to be aware and minimize to the extent that we can the obstacles for getting help. Um, from the very top level, then once we got that buy-in and that support, we started to develop the educational materials and do training. We started with the training for managers, and some of the things we talked about with those managers was talk to your people. 
check in, ask how they're doing. And we would coach them through those conversations because we didn't want a manager to come by and ask someone how you're doing and run away because they didn't know what to do with what they might hear as an answer. If someone said, I'm not doing well, and that manager didn't know what to do, that obviously could make things more difficult. So we did a lot of training around that. We also did training around how do you assign these cases? Who gets these cases? Where is someone in their life? Is that a good time for them to have that? Or should people be able to come in and out of this work? Um, take a few cases or some people feel like they this is what they do and this is the only case work that interests them. And maybe that's okay, but um, having some conversations around gauging those sorts of issues. Talking to the managers about setting healthy examples, you know, Again, the culture can tend to be you're the first one there, you're the last one to leave. That may not really be the example that you want to set when you want your people to be healthy. Um, talking about integrating all of these strategies into the culture right from the day they come in. This is just how we roll. This is what we do. We talk with the AP, they're available, they're a resource, it's confidential, et cetera and making sure that the managers are aware of the resources available. Some, some things were already existing like listservs and um, other, other things that were already in place. We went ahead and, and just optimized that. We also talked with management about um, having dedicated resources. Sometimes in, in some of the offices, we actually provided a standalone computer. This is what you use when you're gonna view evidence. Um, some people felt like it was more helpful for them to look at it on their own desktop. Um, my feeling was if there's a screensaver of your kids or here's your family photos, that may not necessarily be the place where you wanna view these materials. I've had other folks that have come back to me and said, no, that's exactly why I wanna do it there because that's what gives me the impetus um, and challenge that into my work. So that can be a very individual situation. So after we um, did, did the training and kind of got some devoted equipment and get, got some other logistical supports into place, um, we, uh, well, we also partnered with people in the community through the ICAC or the Lawyers Assistance Program. We found sometimes had some good opportunities for speakers that would come in and talk as well. So they didn't always have to hear from the same person just to kind of validate what we, what we knew um, and to reinforce the message. Then we moved on to like the trial teams and looking at it's again, and I've heard people say this this morning, thankfully, it's not just the trial team that's impacted. Um, it's not just the prosecutors. It could be that person who is the receptionist who sees these folks coming in the front door, could be anyone in the office, but also could be um, and, and is very likely family and friends as well, talking with the team around that, talking with them about how they handle these viewing sessions. Um, do they debrief as they get done or how does that all happen? And then talking to them about um, how they can spread this message throughout the office. One of the things we found, although we started with the Project Safe Childhood work, which is child exploitation, it very quickly, once the word got out that there was this service, so to speak, for this population, other people were coming forward and saying, hey, what about me? And I was so glad to hear prosecutors saying that, look, I'm working this capital case and I'm in, my trial team is impacted. And so um, what can you do for us? And we were more than happy to reach across um, and provide that service for them as well. So our peer support team members, which consists of um, anybody, everybody from victim witness to um, prosecutors to lit support. We have, we have each representative from each of those areas and we give them some specialized training. Um, they will work with those folks as well. And that's a completely anonymous type service. They do work under kind of under my clinical direction. And so if there are some issues, I always have them debrief after a case. I don't necessarily, we don't want to know the name. We don't keep numbers. We don't do any of that stuff. Um, we just want to make sure that we're available to help debrief our team members as well. Um, the next thing that we looked at, or actually this all kind of happened simultaneously, was working with the individuals 
And we were very fortunate in that we have here in Columbia, South Carolina, the National Advocacy Center, which is where all of our folks come and go for training at different points of their career. So just about every time that there was a training, uh, because I'm here in Columbia, I would be down there and I would be at least, you know, just kind of talking to people in the hallway or putting out brochures or just if there's five minutes and a speaker shows up late, I'm going to jump up there and say, hey, just want to introduce myself and this is what we do. Um, so getting the word out any way that we can webinars, newsletters, a lot of marketing materials, informational uh, videos, you name it. In dealing with the individual prosecutors, um, one of the things that we make sure that we underscore for them is something they already know is that this can be the most difficult but also the most rewarding work that you will ever do as well. So many say I, there, there's no higher calling. This is this is really where I want to be. This feels like the pinnacle of the work for me. And um, we're happy to support that. Um, what we want to do is make sure that they're doing it in a healthy sort of way. I've heard people talk earlier this morning about different scales and assessment measures that are used. And I think those are fantastic. One of the things I recommend to people is when they come into the work, they, they kind of go online and they can do this in the privacy of their own home, home or whatever. And they go on and they do maybe the pro qual, which is gonna give them the information on compassion, satisfaction, compassion, fatigue and burnout. Look where you are. And then six months from now or four months from now or what have you, look again, do that again and see where you are. Just to gauge, give you some, kind of third party objective information as to how you're doing. So many folks say, oh, in the rear view mirror, I wasn't doing very well, but I didn't know it at the time. I was so immersed. Um, we try to talk to people about setting, setting time, setting, um, doing specific strategies around viewing, limit the amount of time that you spend viewing this material. Don't do it at the end of the day because that's what you're gonna carry home with you. Don't put it off because you don't wanna look at these materials and then here you are finding yourself alone in the office on a weekend doing a marathon session. That can be very detrimental. So there are some specific strategies and techniques that we share with people. Um, please talk with your family members. As we know, relationships are impacted. And whenever relationships are impacted, the other person always thinks they did something wrong. So let them know ahead of time. And I say, even if it needs to be a signal to say, this is one of those days what I know I need to do is go get a run, go to the gym, go garden, whatever, and then we'll come back and reconvene. But it's not about anything you did. It's about what, what's going on with my work right now that will help the, the family member to understand. And sometimes that's how we get buy-in to reluctant prosecutors is, but your family's probably impacted by this as well, or your family may be that third party that's noticing a difference in you. We can help them. We can talk with them as well. So sometimes that's an entree into helping that individual. And, and the last thing, because I, I think I'm kind of running out of time here, um, is um, please be aware, take, take your vacation. No one ever takes their vacation. No one ever rests in between cases. One of the things we know is that there's a fair amount of, there's a lot of compassion satisfaction from this work. When you finally get that, you get that good outcome, you get something positive happen, but we never stop and say, oh, that that was great. We may go out and have a few drinks with colleagues or whatever, but unless you build in that time for that rest and that, that recovery, that restorative time, you have difficulty then resulting in that post-traumatic growth. And I guess that's a good point for me to, to, to leave it. Anyone who has other questions, I'd be happy to hear it from them. Cheryl, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, you're going to share those anti-trauma uh, cupcakes with everybody? that you have on your screensaver, I, I think everybody- I know, I laughed, I'm so sorry about that. that is, I had to use my daughter's computer, she's got the best tech in the house. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, uh, Cheryl. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, Dr. Kate Porterfield. I guess I'm gonna call her the, the guru of trauma. I don't know, that, that, that sounds insulting, but I, <laughs> I mean, when I, when I read about your background and all the work you've done with victims of torture, you work with lawyers, you work with journalists, you've worked with Innocence Project people. I mean, I could go on, but I'd rather you go ahead and, and talk to us. I know you've been with us all morning. Uh, maybe also you, you could weave in the question we got is, is the way prosecutors and defense lawyers, uh, do they deal with trauma in different ways? I mean, is, is it a different thing? 
Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll let you carry it away. And I'm going to tell everybody, we're going to go to 1210 with this panel, and then we'll take a lunch break. Whoever wants to stay, we're going to have Kate lead us in a breathing exercise, but we'll, we'll come to that in just a minute. So we're going to go to 1210. Take Great. it away, Kate. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks, Mark. You can hear me. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay, good. So hi, everybody. Uh, it's really nice to be here. I want to thank Mark and his team for inviting me and Wake Forest Law School, of course. Um, I'm going to dive right in because I have a, a pretty fast and furious uh, stuff I want to power through um, to, as to finish up this really excellent panel with um, and morning, by the way, I just thought all the presenters were really incredible. Um, so I, I want to give you a little intro and then dive into a couple PowerPoint uh, slides about about my material. But what I want to start with today is, is let you know that what I'm hoping to do is share with you a frame that I found really helpful in my work. I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, started my work at the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture in New York City, and have worked with really um, an incredible array of wonderful clients at Bellevue who have suffered severe trauma. And over the last 10 years, I've actually expanded that work and been really fortunate to learn about the impact of not just severe primary trauma, but secondary trauma on journalists in war zones and covering natural disasters with uh, attorneys dealing with really serious trauma in their cases, um, as well as uh, human rights workers going into the field. So I've been really lucky to learn about secondary traumatic stress. And I've found that some of the application of the frame that I find helpful with uh, trauma survivors, some of that application really does work with secondary trauma as well. So I wanna quickly share that frame with you. Um, it's called a biopsychosocial model. And that's, I didn't make that up. That's a very common word in traumatology. And then I'd like to kind of give you a, um, just a preview of a couple of the practices that I think can be really effective and helpful. So let me begin um, with some slides here. Um, uh, Mark, if you could give me a verbal, because I can't see it, just that you can see that slide, that'd be great. Yes. Okay, great. So what we're going to start with today is, is the idea of, of this frame. And what I'm going to argue to you in my, in my time is that there is really, there's a lot of use that you can have to having a frame a cognitive cons construct around what you have been through in your life, including adversity and trauma. And so when I do this with trauma survivors, so torture survivors or folks who've been through violence or other kinds of um, severe experiences, the frame that I try to introduce um, as I work with them is the idea of that recognition of something has happened to me. I've been through something difficult and it has affected me and I'm going to acknowledge that that has happened and that there have been effects on me. And then I'm gonna to start to be able to think about what helped me, what are the things that actually got me through? We talked a bit this morning about resilience and the folks in those, that early panel talking about um, how they survived really serious traumas that they um, were exposed to. And then even if you're really, really um, fortunate, the idea that maybe there was uh, what Cheryl actually just referred to, I think, uh, post-traumatic growth, which is not to say, hey, this is great, I'm glad it happened, of course not, but that there were ways that I've changed and grown that I'm actually going to own and um, open up and sort of accept about myself. So that frame for me begins with the idea of teaching. And again, Cheryl hit a lot of really great points about um, psychoeducation um, for, for folks to first learn about what they have been through and learn about what it, um, how it leaves a mark to be exposed to trauma. And so the, the frame I really like is what, I, is what is called a biopsychosocial frame, which says that traumatic events, extreme events, uh, impact us in, in multiple dimensions of our humanity. And when I teach my clients about this, I'll say often, look, we're wired to survive. We are, we are bodily uh, survival machines. We are mammals whose body first takes on the stress and the threat of traumas and then carries the threat afterwards with some of the impacts that we'll see, which I'll try to break down in a minute. But we are wired to survive in, as a body and that's an amazing capacity we have that actually does save us. We are wired to make meaning. We are psychological beings and we make meaning about our feelings that we feel and, and our brain, especially this frontal part, puts them usually uh, those feelings into sort of a language-based construct, right? We usually think things about our feelings and that's part of being a psychological being. And trauma lands in our psychology, as we know. So our meaning making ends up being a really important part of of, what, uh, of understanding what has happened to us and what we're gonna you know, carry with us from it. And we are wired to attach. We, you cannot thrive and do well as a human without human connection, whether from infancy on into uh, late in life. We must have other humans in our world. And that social contact can be a manifestation of traumatic stress, the way we isolate, the way we get irritable, the way we fight, the way we push people away. 
and it can be a source of tremendous strength and healing uh, after trauma. So this biopsychosocial frame for me is always where I start with my clients, uh, including with secondary traumatic stress uh, in whether, you know, when I'm working with folks. So, so what happens? Well, traumatic stress means, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to do a big definition of this, but events that really overwhelm our normal coping. In other words, the stuff coming at us is more than we can just sort of get through with a little bit of white knuckling, right? Normal coping stops working and we start having some um, threats coming into our system that tell us you're really, really in trouble. And amazingly, going back to that biological model, we're a survival machine, right? So our nervous system is wired to involuntarily kick in and help us when we are traumatized and under serious threat. And so when I don't have time to do a big description of our nervous system right now, but a lot of this will be familiar to you all when you think about fight or flight, right? That's understood to be the way that our nervous system, when it recognizes a stress, kind of amps up, right? And it amps up with the sympathetic nervous system giving us a, a set of reactions that are thought of as uproar reactions heart racing, you start breathing in a more shallow, rapid way, your pupils dilate to take in information, uh, your gastrointestinal system stops so that you can conserve energy and use it on muscle uh, you know, mobility and, and speed. All of that happens within seconds when you are under a trauma moment, right? I am under stress and I am under threat. Now that nervous system reaction actually also then has the flip side. And I think of these arrows, you'll be seeing them again. The red means I'm going up, I'm amping up into fight or flight. And our, our nervous system also then takes us down into a parasympathetic reaction after we've been under threat or after we've exposed ourselves or been exposed to too much of that nervous system arousal. And that shutdown reaction starts to take over, which makes us lower energy, heart goes down, heart rate, uh, blood pressure goes back into a normal pattern, breathing goes into a normal pattern. The body's able to evacuate and do other kinds of processes that it needs to do. So this fine-tuned homeostatic process, right, of amping you up when you're in trouble and bringing you down when you are um, you know, coming out of the threat is actually uh, then something that can leave a mark on us after trauma. And the problem is then we're kind of having those reactions, uproar reactions, heart racing, sweating, trouble breathing, or being shut down, detached, kind of feeling low energy after the trauma. And so that's where that sort of mark of trauma, which is classically called, thought of as PTSD, uh, is a problem. The trauma reaction is now coming afterwards as I remember or I'm sort of intrusively gripped by images of what happened. Now, everything I just described very quickly, that sympathetic and parasympathetic reaction is part of the construct of PTSD. But what we also know is that it's part of secondary traumatic stress as well. And what that means is that secondary traumatic stress, and lots of these amazing speakers already hit this, so I'm going to be fast, um, but secondary traumatic stress really mirrors the same symptoms as post-traumatic stress, which is that uproar reactions and intrusive arousal problems, so feeling edgy, irritable, uh, having images come back to you intrusively, those kinds of problems persist after you've had an exposure to other people's trauma, to stories of trauma, to images of trauma. And here I, am, here I am having the same kinds of symptoms that someone with PTSD might have. Uh, you also can have nightmares and flashbacks. Uh, you can have a really exhausted, fatigued presentation from being um, overly stressed by trauma, uh, even secondary trauma. Attention and concentration problems. This is a huge one. Folks who are really receiving just too much of what we call a dose of traumatic stress will say, I just kind of can't take in stuff the same way. I can't write the same way. I know, I know for you attorneys, that's a huge demand on your work is both taking in information and being able to write about it. And so attorneys will talk to me um, and say, you know, I'm really having trouble functioning with my attention and concentration. And I think it is a, a matter of the stress overload I've been experiencing. Social isolation, also a part of the symptoms that can come from secondary traumatic stress. And then one of the ones that I'm really, really interested in and have spent a lot of time talking to folks about is this idea of meaning making. Remember, bio, psycho, social. So if the bio or those irritability, those nightmares, that um, edgy feeling, the psychological is what do I do to make meaning of what I've done in my work, right? How do I feel about that case I just did? How do I feel about that client I just worked with who I know caused tremendous harm to other people? 
Or how do I feel about that person who I just, um, you know, assisted in their um, prosecution and they now face a death sentence? I mean, Mr. Greer's discussion of that was incredibly profound. And I think uh, Cheryl uh, also raised those issues, which is the, that participating in prosecution also can raise issues of, of traumatization as well and meaning making. Um, sometimes that, word, that that idea is called moral injury, and I don't have a ton of time to talk about it, but if you're interested in it, I could, I could refer some articles. Moral injury comes out of the, the journalism field initially and sometimes out of um, military service as well. And the idea is that one has participated in things that in the aftermath you feel unbelievably overwhelmed by and even question some of your own actions or at least um, what it meant to be part of it. And I think for those folks working in uh, criminal justice and sometimes in asylum processes as well, uh, or asylum practice as well, that moral injury can really be a painful, painful um, place where meaning making goes kind of south. And what I mean by that is people then struggle with guilt, shame, and self-attack. Um, so secondary traumatic stress, I think, we've, I think we're pretty convinced if we're still sitting here at, at 12 o'clock that this is a real thing uh, and that this is what it looks like. Uh, also, we've talked about self-medication uh, and really just a sense of lack of pleasure or feeling um, positive in one's life. So let me shift to a few minutes of what I find to be the kind of top strategies for dealing with secondary traumatic stress. And this is what I argue in my work with folks. First of all, I'm a huge believer in what I, uh, what we call in the field self-assessment. And that means, doesn't mean none of us need professional help and it doesn't mean we shouldn't go to therapy, but what it means is you actually have a real capability to look at your own biopsychosocial processes and practices and say, how am I doing? Where am I seeing um, rough spots, right? Where am I seeing I'm not doing so well? And then when you identify them, you can actually start putting in some little practices and some little interventions. And we talked about the idea, I think uh, Lindsay was talking about how do you make this stuff stick? Um, and part of the way uh, that, that I really recommend you make it stick is that you consider secondary traumatic stress practice a part of your toolbox as a lawyer. Meaning just like you learn motions practice and you learn writing and you learn arguing, um, you also say, how do I manage the stress of this work so that I don't burn out, so that I don't do a bad job? So a couple things. First of all, I'm a big believer in self-assessment, as I've just said, and I teach everybody this, whether you're a survivor of torture and trauma or um, you know, a big shot attorney uh, doing lots of work. First step in self-assessment is you have to be willing to say, I will pause. I will, I will find a moment to sit. I will build into my work a moment of stopping. And when you stop, the second part is I will now notice. I will take stock of my physical, my psycho, my social, and start to pay attention to where I'm seeing resilience and where I'm seeing struggle. So when I teach folks about this, I say, first of all, let's learn a little more about that red arrow and that gray arrow. And let's say, how are you doing just in this moment that you're pausing, right? How are you doing in what we call the window of tolerance? Where is your arousal locating itself? Is it amping up into the red zone or are you kind of shutting down and going into the gray zone where your body's kind of in more what we call hypoarousal? And you know, I recommend for people to print this little graphic and stick it up on your wall at your desk. And when you're feeling good, you've had that cup of coffee and you're kind of tapping away on an email and over here you're working on a, another piece of writing and you like your to-do list is already going, you know, you're doing great with it, then you're in the green zone. That means you're in the kind of optimal state of functionality you're not over aroused and stressed and you're not under aroused and fatigued or shut down. And what you'll notice is when you start going into the red zone, if you use the pause notice practice, you'll say, ah, there it is. This is that thing about that red arrow. I feel edgy. I'm feeling like I shouldn't have more coffee. I'm not thinking clearly. I can't multitask as well. I'm getting like a little bit distractible. I'm getting over activated. And at that point you can say, I need to implement something to break this pattern. And I have a bunch of recommendations. I make everything from get up and do uh, a 10 minute walk to do 10 push ups and sit ups, to play a beautiful song that you love, to um, drink a big glass of ice water, to go splash your face in ice. These are all literal things that I have recommended for folks when you're in the red zone to break that pattern a little bit, break that moment and bring yourself back down to an optimal state. Those are quick ones, by the way. The best thing of course, is to take a real break. Um, and find social connection that, that is meaningful for you. When you go into the gray zone, you have the opposite problem, right? Which is you're starting to feel a real sense of fatigue, low energy, and dif difficulty concentrating and functioning. Here again, um, we can practice some of the things I just recommended for red zone, but you, you're noticing your body is starting to really detach and it's time to re-energize yourself. A 20 minute nap, 
ice water, a walk, a connection to a good friend or colleague who you trust, some way to reactivate that nervous system. So one of the questions I'll say then is, if you're thinking about window of tolerance, can you pause and notice just what's my body doing right now to help me? Because believe me, when your body's going into one of these two zones, it's actually telling you something, it's helping you. And actually I thought it was really powerful. Um, I think it was, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, who said this? I think it was Mark Godsey said, um, I was a mess. I was crying all the time. And I would have said to Mark back then, uh, and I bet, uh, I bet Dr. Marison did, um, you're not a mess. You're crying because you, your body is telling you something and you're listening to it. That's not being a mess. That's actually listening to what your body's telling you. So if you're amping up, your body's telling you, I'm getting too, too much of that nervous system arousal uh, from, from whatever reason. And if you're shutting down, it's telling you, hey, I'm starting to disconnect. And both of those deserve attention. Okay, so just a couple more quick thoughts, and I'm not going to go over this whole chart, but I, this is another thing I'd recommend that you create for yourself, which is I tell my, my patients to make, we're going to make a biopsychosocial chart, and we're going to ask ourselves, how am I doing in each category? And when you're feeling bad, you can stop and look at this and just go down the list, say, where am I feeling bad? Okay, let me look on bio. Well, definitely I have a knot in my stomach. Um, I have not eaten since morning and I've had three cups of coffee and no, I'm really not feeling any pleasure. What am I thinking? Okay, well, I'm feeling kind of anxious. I'm feeling that. You know, sometimes I'll say to patients, a feeling is a word and a thought is usually a sentence. So for me, I'll use an example. If I'm feeling anxious, I'll notice my thoughts tend to be stuff like, you've got too much going on. You're not doing a good job with your work. You know, the kids are wondering where you are. You know, I start down a little, a little cascade of thoughts that are quite self-attacking. And that kind of pattern of thoughts and feelings being self-attacking needs an interruption and it needs an intervention. And by the way, I know lawyers are very vulnerable to that because you guys take on a lot of responsibility. And then social, who am I talking to? Who's around? Am I isolating or am I reaching out? So I'm arguing this piece about self-assessment to you. And you know, before I, I'm gonna wrap up in a minute and I'm not gonna spend much time on um, this bit about risk factors because we've already talked about it. But you know, once you learn to self-assess, you can really start thinking about, well, where am I vulnerable and how come? Because one of the things we know is that the risk factors for secondary trauma are things like, hey, your own trauma history. And by the way, if you're doing this kind of work, chances are there's something that brought you into the work of um, you know, working in justice and working to fight for um, you know, people who've been hurt. Uh, join the club is what I always say. Uh, and you might have a kind of identification with a particular case or a, per, or a client or story that, that makes you be then a little more vulnerable to have a secondary traumatic reaction, um, and especially lack of social support. And I think Lindsay Harris spoke a lot about this. Social support is a huge predictor. Working on your own, not reaching out to folks, not having personal and professional contacts who are part of your, um, your work. Uh, obviously, also any other life stress hitting you at that same time as you're doing hard work will definitely tax you a little more. Protective factors, again, we've talked about them, I'll just be pretty fast here, but definitely we find that folks who are older and more experienced actually have often learned more. So those senior lawyers, those of you who have learned techniques, you should be finding ways to teach that to the younger lawyers and to, to mentoring them. Um, team constructs of cohesion or sort of meaning making that's done together can be a really great protective factor. Um, training in secondary traumatic stress, that's why I think Cheryl was talking about making that such a critical part of DOJ's training is really a good idea. Um, and then, you know, things that we've already talked about are protective, connecting to others and, and having a self-care practice. I want to leave you with a quick exercise I really recommend for folks, um, especially lawyers, which is if you are doing your self-assessment and you're like, oh, I feel cruddy today. Why do I feel so bad? I'm working on this case and I just feel so bad about it. I'm doing such a bad job and it's going to go badly. And you're noticing that spinning happening, right? Um, one of the things I recommend is to ask yourself about that, that situation. Okay, I feel bad about X, whether this case or something that's happening with a colleague or whatever. What part of this situation do I or did I have control over and literally list it? And what part did I not have control over? And I'm telling you this because in my experience working on, with a lot of attorneys now, um, there is a lot that falls into this column over here and folks often don't recognize that the part they are feeling more upset about or more distressed or having negative meaning making about is actually the systemic stuff or the injustice stuff, the racism, the inequities of poverty, um, things that are so much bigger than what you could have done. 
And again, that's not to say our work doesn't matter, but it's a way to try to break down meaning making so that you can sort of focus on what do I have control over? I have control over doing a good job, being an ethical person, working well, taking care of myself and, um, and being a good human, right? The other stuff you really probably can't control so much. So I'll end with this vis with two visuals. Um, one is again, I really like this chart about being a self-aware attorney and building a self-care practice that is intentional, that involves pacing, which is looking at how much work you do and take on and when you do it, uh, including your boundaries. Um, the biological part of our, our functioning, right? That part of us that's wired to survive. What's it telling you? Listen to your body as it tells you and shows you where you're struggling, whether with sleep, appetite, mood, irritability, or whatever. Uh, where is the psychological part of you wired to make meaning? What is that telling you and where are you attending to it? Are you using meaning making, processing, thinking, spirituality, um, therapy, reflection, mindfulness practice? We've heard a lot about that this morning um, from especially Mark is a great advocate for that. Using a mindfulness or contemplative practice to address your thinking around your work. And finally, who is your A-team? Do you use them? Do you go to them? And how do you build um, social support as part of your work? In case you notice, there's one word that appears in all four of these quadrants, which is pleasure. I'm a huge believer that the way to also combat traumatic stress is to have fun and laugh and do stuff you love. Go in nature, exercise, see art, whatever it is, do sports. But pleasure is so, so important to, um, to healing when you do hard work like this. And my final image is that I'll share is that I really uh, advocate my teams to do this at the end of the day. And I was thinking about Cheryl's uh, idea on this too, <clears throat> in terms of where you have discovery or other material that's disturbing on your chart, on your um, computer. At the end of the day, I I'll argue to some of my teams to close their computer, put something pretty on it, and then send that picture to each other and say, hey, my day of work is done and my work was really valuable today, but now I'm not gonna be thinking about the hard stuff. Um, I'm gonna be actually doing stuff for me. Um, I'm going to sh stop share. Uh, I do have a must read page for you. Sorry, got to show you that. Um, these are essential, essential, essential reading if you are doing this work. Uh, and by this work, I mean any kind of lawyering or advocacy that involves vulnerable people. You got to read Judith Herman, Bessel van der Kolk, and Nadine Burke Harris. So I think I'll stop there. Um, Mark, I'm going to pass it back to you. And then it's 12. Ooh, well, I don't know if people want to stay for breathing. I'm happy to keep whoever wants to at the end and do a minute of breathing and grounding. But thank you, guys. Kate, I've, uh, I've just filed for a patent to turn you into an avatar to be on my phone or to reduce you to a small creature like Jiminy Cricket on my shoulder to say, OK, what are you feeling now? That is so nice. If I, I, I'm honored. Thank you. I'm honored to be shrunken down. Will you be my Jiminy Cricket? I mean, I, I, you know, but I think the lesson that you're teaching us here is that we, we can internalize these things. Of course, we need systemic and institutional support, but I think that's what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from you. And that's certainly what I have found with uh, contemplative practices with all of the, I mean, what you just said in a nutshell, which is what I've learned in the last 13 years of going away on retreats for two weeks at a time. So, you know, that, that's mindfulness is what you just described. And I, it, it applies to everything that we do. It applies to prosecutors, judges, jurors, defense lawyers, no matter what. We all have human brains and we have human bodies. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk, the book in the middle on your chart, it's like the greatest thing I've ever read. I've, I buy copies and give it away. There's lots of other books as well. Um, we, yeah, we're, we're kind of running out of time here. I, some of these questions I think have already been addressed. And, and, and of course, there's gonna be articles generated from all of this. Uh, let me just ask the panelists who are on this last one, did anybody have anything you'd like to add, Cheryl or Mark or Donna? Well, um, if it's okay with the, uh, Mark, did you have something? Okay, thank you all, this is, it's been fantastic uh, and it's been a lot, but you know, we needed to create this awareness this morning. Um, if you need to go to lunch, you know, we, well, we all need to go to lunch, but you know, <laughs> feel free to go ahead and leave. When you think about this afternoon, um, for all of us people who identify as white or who have been racialized as white, thinking about, think about putting on a different sort of skin 
and dealing with exactly these same issues, you know, um, because it's a whole completely different thing. And I'm, I personally am only gradually learning about that, you know, after 40 years of mostly black and brown clients uh, representing them and, uh, and same with prosecutors too, you know, it's, uh, we have, we all have a lot, we have a lot to learn. Um, if people do want to stay around, Kate has gladly offered to sit on my shoulder and guide us in a breathing exercise. So Kate, take it away. And the, uh, the room will stay on. You don't need to sign off if you don't want to. I think you can stay on and just you come back at one and we'll be back again. But Kate, Great. I'll so Mark, you want me to go? I'm going to go ahead and do the breathing then. And then um, if you, right. I won't know if you signed off. So I like, I like the idea that they keep their camera on and then it still looks like 600 people are, <laughs> are listening. Um, first of all, the, the cheapest supply you're ever going to buy for self-care is buy yourself a thing of post-it notes and you should stick them around your desk and you should put up pause and you should put up breathe and you should put up um, valuable. And when you look at valuable, you say the work I do is valuable and you should put up labor and labor is the beautiful gift you give in this work. I'm like a huge believer in post-it notes. So please go buy post-it notes. I do not have any endorsement from um, whatever company it is that makes post-it notes or any financial investment in them. Okay, I'm gonna take whoever's still on there. It might just be you and me, Mark, but I'm gonna take us through a, a very simple breathing pattern and a grounding. This should take about three minutes, I think, um, maybe four. And I, I'm telling you, I, I cannot endorse this enough. I use this myself. God knows how many times a day, probably 20. Uh, and I have used it so much more during the, the era of COVID and isolation and time home with families um, and, and lots of folks struggling. So um, I'm going to teach you a breathing pattern that's really simple. It's called 444. Four, four. Uh, and 444 four, four is simply a, a breathing pattern where we're going to go in through the nostrils with a nice slow four breath, four second breath. I'll count it. Then you're going to hold it for four if you can sort of thinking of that breath as going into your abdomen imagine your abdomen you know kind of holding it for four seconds and then out through the mouth so i'm going to count us through that in a minute this is a breathing pattern by the way that's been shown to reduce heart um heart rate and the more you practice breathing retraining the more your heart quickly responds in other words in studies of it if, if you get yourself doing this even when you're not distressed then later when you do it, when you are distressed, your heart actually gets the message. So it's a really great, easy strategy. You can use it anywhere, any place. So before we do that though, I am gonna ground us. And what I mean by ground us is so much of anxiety and so much of stress is that we go, we jump into the future and get incredibly worried. And we think back on the past and feel really bad about things. And so grounding is a way to say, hey, right now I'm gonna sit in this minute, in this space, and I'm just gonna pause here and not think about the future or the past. So as we do the grounding, I'm just gonna invite you to listen to my voice for the next minute and then we'll do our breathing. Grounding we're gonna start with is we're gonna take our feet and I wanna ask you to take your feet and push them on the floor as hard as you can, kind of really pushing against that ground. If you have your shoes off, you'll feel the, the flat, strong surface underneath you. And really notice the feeling right now as your feet feel the earth underneath you, feel the floor underneath you and recognize that it's holding you in this moment on this ground. And as we start letting ourselves feel the ground underneath us and this moment that we're sharing together, I'm gonna to also ask you to start to take awareness of your hands and take your hands and put them on the top of your legs, on your thighs. And as you do that, we're gonna to start to kind of relax a little, roll our shoulders back and try to notice the feeling of your fingertips as your nerve endings take in the texture of your clothing on your legs or if you're wearing shorts, your, your skin and that incredible power that your body has to take in those nerve, nerve ending messages and send them to your brain and your feet taking in that message of that the ground underneath you. That's your strong body telling you a message. You're here now and you're, you're safe. As you ground yourself, I'd like you to look at your environment for a minute. Just kind of look around and find three things you hadn't noticed before. Just they could be little or large. And as you look at those three things, again, thinking about your eyes and the amazing elegance of your eyes sending a message to your brain as you notice those three things, the color of them, the shape, your feet are on the floor, your hands are on your strong legs, your eyes are taking in your environment. And now listen if you can. And besides my voice, try to listen to one other thing in your environment. Again, noticing that the ears have this excellent structure and capability that's sending a message to your brain. All of this is your body 
being in this moment, being strong and functional. So as we sit here grounded, we're gonna start our breathing together and I'm just gonna begin by having you do an inhale on my, on my signal, four in through the nostrils, hold four and then four out through the mouth, okay? So we'll start now and you're gonna breathe in through your nostrils and one, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale through the mouth, two, three, four, again, inhale, nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, through the mouth, two, three, four, again, inhale, three, four, hold, three, four, exhale, three, four, We'll do two more, inhale, three, four, hold, three, four, exhale. Last one, inhale, hold, exhale. So we'll end with that. I recommend you practice a little grounding yourself this weekend. Uh, I'm gonna, um, thank you all so much. I see some folks wanted to know the books again. So I don't know, Mark, if you want me to pop that back up there or you want to um, share sure. that. Yeah, why don't you, yeah, go okay. ahead. Okay, uh, I got it right there. So those are the three books I really recommend. Judith Herman, Bessel van der Kolk and Nadine Burke Harris. All right. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, let me see if, Kyle or Ethan has any announcements before we take a little break? Thanks, Mark. No announcements for me. Uh, we will see everybody back at 1 p.m. for our next panel. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>